This is Transparency, a podcast by Gender Dysphoria Alliance, hosted by Aaron Kimberly and Aaron Terrell. Each week we'll be joined by people who have personal or professional experience with gender dysphoria and physical transition. We'll also discuss how our trans experiences relate to the concept of gender identity. Join us for a compassionate yet heterodox approach to the question of trans. All right, welcome back to Transparency, where we get to have all kinds of great conversations with people. I'm Aaron Kimberly. My co-host, Aaron Terrell, is away this week, uh, but I'm excited to have Dr. Lisa Lippman here today to talk about her research. Dr. Lippman is perhaps best known for coining the phrase rapid onset gender dysphoria, and she's recently published a paper about detransition. Thanks for being here, Dr. Lippman. Sure, thanks for having me. Um, I've been looking forward to this. Um, yeah, you're, you're, you're right that probably people who are in this topic or interested in this topic probably know about my um, study about youth with gender dysphoria by parent report and then the detransition study. And, um, and you're right, I coined the term rapid onset gender dysphoria, be dysphoria because, um, which now people call ROGD, um, because I needed a term to use to describe a phenomenon. It was really um, I saw something unusual in my own community. I observed, then I observed, you know, parent reports describing a certain situation where teenagers who did not have symptoms of gender dysphoria as a child or no observed signs of gender dysphoria as a child became trans identified gender dysphoric as teenagers, um, often in friendship groups. And so what I just said is a really long phrase. And so if you're trying to study a topic to repeat a phrase over and over, it was just way too cumbersome. So I, I needed a short, simple way to describe that phenomenon. Um, and I chose rapid onset gender dysphoria because it was descriptive and neutral. So that was, that was the beginning of, um, well, actually the beginning of my research is just, um, I noticed in my own community, one after the next teenager was announcing a trans identification and the numbers were just astronomically unlikely given a tiny little town and the fact that they were all in the same friendship group and so that's what piqued my interest in this topic my background is public health and um you know the, the young people in your community that you were noticing this happen to did, did you know any of them well enough to kind of know like have seen them grow up and and know them prior to the trans identity or were they more distant than that in your community? Um, well, I let's see. I was I was rather new to the community. I had okay. recently moved to Rhode Island, so I did not have long histories with any of these individuals. But I did know them in terms of um, you know interactions. So was it the clustering that 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 first drew your attention to this phenomenon? The fact that that it was um, these teens in sort of little groups was that was that what piqued your interest? Actually, what piqued my interest was the numbers. Okay. That you know, first two individuals, you know, came out and identified, and I was like, great! I'm so happy that they feel comfortable sharing with the community and being vocal on social media. And then came a third, a fourth, a fifth. And so at first it was the numbers, you know, over a short period of time. And then the second light bulb was, wait a second, these, these kids are all from the same friendship group. And, and that was just surprising given what the research literature said about numbers and, and what it said about what we know about gender dysphoria in you know, children, adolescents, and adults. It just, those two things really caught my attention. Right. Um, it, you know, when I first re reached out to you, I think it was almost a year ago now, it was the end of last year that um, I was in the midst of doing a literature review. Um, and I know I said I wasn't going to talk much as a clinician here, but, but just um, for some context of how I came across your work. Um, so I was starting to do a bit of trans care uh, with youth in the, in the clinic, and I was seeing something that I was concerned about in that work as well. And being and really confused, A, by what I was seeing clinically, B, what I've experienced as, as a trans man, and 
see what I was just hearing from the clinical community about how we're doing this work today and how different that is from when I went through the system. And somehow those three things, they were just weren't fitting together well for me in, in my head. There seemed to be such a, a disconnect um, in the new trans narrative compared to just my experience of, of being trans in the world. So that's when I really started to dig into a lot of the, the literature, trying to figure out like, how did we how did we come get to this place? What is the evidence for this, this new model of care and, and how different things is, how things are, how different the narrative around trans is these days. And that's when I came across, across your work. And I was on a clinical listserv at the time, trying to express some of these ideas and, um, and I created quite a ripple uh, on the listserv. But one of the conversations that was coming up was um, about Abigail Schreier's book. And people were just asking, who, you know, what do we know about this woman? Who is she? She seems really turfy. You know, those words were being thrown yeah. around. And, um, and I, I didn't really know who she was at that time either. But I started to look into her. I, I'm the kind of person that when something is confusing for me and when a lot of people are um, you know, pushing back on an idea. I don't like to just take people's word for it. I like to go and find out for myself. That's oh, how I got exactly that. Same way. That, yeah. that, that, that's how I got into eating disorders in the first place. Is I noticed all the nurses were um, were really nervous about going and working shifts up on the eating disorders unit. I thought, why is that? Like, why are people so afraid to to go up there? Uh, it's not unusual for people to be in hospitals for nurses to get pulled from one unit, put in another unit. That's that's commons, but why are these nurses refusing to go up to the eating disorders unit? And so I took a I took a, a temporary position there to find out, and I ended up loving it. So um, I definitely see mm. value, right, in going and finding out for myself why are people so afraid or or upset about a topic? Because yeah. a lot of people were voicing concerns about Abba Gaushrai's work, and then of course your name came up in the context of because her her book, her book is all about that this phenomenon. That, that, right. that you've um, identified. And it, it was really confusing for me. Why are people so upset about this? Right. I it, think that's and, a key question and it yeah. surprised me as well. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's why I, you know, I, I read your study and, and reached out to you because I was just at that point, just so confused about what's going on and, and starting to kind of um, formulate a little bit, it was starting to take a, a bit, a bit of shape for me by the time that I reached out, out to you. And, um, but yeah, it, it's still a puzzle for me. So two topics, I mean, I, I know you're not, uh, you know, looking for, um, you don't seem like someone that, that loves the, the, the attention and the, and the, and the backlash um, or the controversy, but you've, you're, you're researching two topics that happen to create a lot of controversy within the trans community, one being, you know, rapid onset gender dysphoria, and now this new study that you've done on on detransition. Um, so, what was it about um, the, the your rapid onset set study, rapid onset gender dysphoria study? Was the your interest in detransition related to the first study, and how do you see those two things fitting together? Yeah. So, um, when I started doing the research um, on gender dysphoria in youth, rapid onset gender dysphoria. Uh, a lot of people are pushing back against the name, but I really do think it's really against the concept. Um, along the way, I met several people who had detransitioned and great people, interesting people, and just hearing about their, their experiences and the fact that they got so much pushback and hostility for talking about their experiences. One, you know, maybe really sad, but also really frustrated and concerned because coming from a medical background, or it's important to know all of the outcomes from an intervention. And I couldn't think of any other example where doctors, society, patients only wanted to hear about the most perfect outcomes and were not interested or even hostile to hearing about experiences where either people had complications or that it was the wrong intervention or the wrong procedure for them. Um, so this struck me as um, as really surprising and really important because I think if you want to help people, you really have to understand the big picture. And that means putting the health and well-being of all people who experience gender dysphoria above any 
favorite approach or above wanting to be right because I want to know what's true and what's not true because otherwise you're not going to know how to help people and how not to hurt them. And I think that in our current culture, some folks have been are so attached to this one approach, the gender identity affirmative approach, sort of a fast track um, to transition that not only do they put that first and foremost, but they use that as a proxy for determining who supports or doesn't support trans people. And I feel like that's backwards and it's somewhat problem. Well, I, I think it is a problem because as a result to being so attached to one approach, people can be very hostile to information that challenges their beliefs. So, you know, my perspective is I want to know what's what's true and what's not true, even if I have to change my beliefs, because that's what matters. And I think pe some people are coming from this position like this is the approach. This is the answer. If there is research evidence or even people's experiences that contradict that or make you know you think twice about it, there's pushback. And so, I mean, I've thought long and hard about the whole pushback, and I—that's what I think might be might have occurred and is still occurring. Where did the most of the pushback come from, for you? Well, that's a great question. Um, it came from a lot of places. So, the research was published, and then within days there was, let's say, a storm on social media. And so a lot of people were angry on social media, whether they were activists or, you know, I think it was predominantly activists at first. And at that time I was maybe naive because I thought that social media was separate than real life and separate from say universities and journals. Like I really thought that there was a divide, but there really wasn't a divide because as people were complaining and very, let's say, very passionate about the topic, they were tagging, um, you know, my university and the journal editors and things like that. So there was this immediate transfer, you know, into the real world. And so who were, who were the folks that were doing it? It became really interesting in that, yes, there were activists, and then there are clinicians and researchers who are supportive of that um, that one approach, the, you know, I, I stumble over the language because I, I don't think affirmative is a great word for that. It's really more about, you know, one cause, one treatment or fast tracking. But anyway, but there are a lot of clinicians and researchers who are really gung ho and sort of part of that ideological perspective. And so there was pushback there. Um, and then on the other side, there were similar people in offering support. So parents were grateful, clinicians were reaching out to me, grateful because they were seeing this in their practices, um, academics as well. So it was really like, there were a lot of different types of people on both sides. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I mean, what it looks like for me, it, it, because you know, I, my experience was, I, you know, I had lifelong gender dysphoria. I eventually did, you know, I lived as, as um, a butch lesbian for many years. And in my community, there were, there were some butchier butches than I was, you know, who really strongly identified as, as lesbians. And then they described having gender dysphoria, but had incorporated that into um, a butch identity for themselves in a way that they didn't identify as trans and they had no intention of transitioning. Um, but then there were some of us at, at, um, who did transition and there's so many different factors that went into that decision. Um, I mean, severity of gender dysphoria being one of them, but there were lots of other factors as well in terms of just, you know, a person's coping abilities, um, a person's social networks, a uh, person's politics, like so many different factors. And, um, so I obviously I did decide to transition and, and it was helpful for me, but then I just kind of went left the community and got on with my life. I, you know, I didn't do this to fit into any particular community. I don't. And at that time, I mean, that was 20, 15, 20 years ago. And um, some of these ideas, which I call queer theory, because that's where those ideas come from. Some of those, there were people in the community at that time that had some of those ideas but it really surprised me 
the extent to which those ideas have completely taken over the system of care and the entire trans narrative now. And I'm old enough that I, I remember where those ideas came from. And, and it started as this, these very fringe ideas that have now completely defined what it means to be trans. And I hadn't been aware of that, to the extent to which that has crept in. Um, and, and, that, and that really concerns me because I think what I'm seeing is um, the, these young people who, you know, they, they might identify as non-binary and they've got the blue hair and piercings and lots of makeup and, you know, a lot playing with their dress, the way they own their clothing styles. And they've really learned this ling lingo, like they can rattle off a bunch of neo pronouns. And so it's become this, this cultural phenomenon. Uh, it's very queer theory based cultural phenomenon that I think is at least part of an explanation for the phenomenon that you were maybe seeing and these parents that we're seeing is they're adopting, um, it's kind of like the new punk or the new goth or the new, you know, you know whatever, right? It's, it's this new cultural right. phenomenon. It's yeah. It, yeah, it's a, it's a political movement. And, but I worry to what extent do these kids really understand where those ideas came from and what the purpose of those ideas were because it seems to be presented to them in in the public school system as this is just reality that there is there just is a gender spectrum and that you know that that these these things are somehow scientific you know and a naturally occurring phenomenon when i'm not fooled by that i mean i remember learning that stuff in the early 90s in university as a political movement it was a political strategy so I'm quite concerned that like, do these kids understand that what they're attaching to is a political strategy? And if they do power to them, right. If they, if they really believe in a, in the politics yeah. of that, sure. I mean, people are allowed to, but I don't know how many of them, of them really don't. do. No, no. I think that this is really promoted as this is the way to be kind and supportive and, and tolerant. And those are all great things. But the fact that it's been wrapped around this philosophy, which may not be in everybody's best interest or may not be a healthy approach, um, is what the problem is. So mm -hmm. I do feel that there's a little bait and switch that one, it's being promoted as this is reality. So we really don't know. There's not been identified an innate gender identity that resides biologically within a person. Um, and that can either match or mismatch. Um, and the belief that there's only that's the only reason that somebody would identify as trans or feel gender dysphoric and so getting from wanting to be kind and supportive which i'm on i am 100 on board with to this belief and then the belief if you feel certain ways it means you need medical transition i feel like there are a couple of things connected that can really um pull a kid into a a path that's not the best path for them. I do have some kids in in my own personal life that that seem to be going down that path where they you know they showed no signs of gender nonconformity or gender dysphoria in their childhood at all. Um, who now all of a sudden you know they they just look and dress very differently in sort of like a like a pseudo sort of punk goth sort of appearance mm -hmm. um, as an adolescent. Um, seems a lot more emotionally uh, a lot more emotionally unstable than, than I've ever seen throughout their whole childhood and adopting you know these neo pronouns and and this kind of queer trans identity and it's and but it's 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 one thing to say you know what I I did that I transitioned in order to be more comfortable with myself like when right. I transitioned it wasn't it wasn't the invention of a whole new persona I dress the same as I always have I talk I act I, my interests are all the same my appearance obviously changed but for me it was just about settling into who I am in a way that I'm not getting flack from the rest of the world. Like I just, I just feel like I fit better. Yeah. Whereas these other kids, it's like they're adopting this whole new persona where they're dressing different, they're acting different, they're talking different. And that's quite different than, than what I experienced. Yeah. And I think also the gravity that they put on it and the emotionality, which you mentioned. So I think that, you know, kids wearing whatever they want 
is great, you know, it's, I, you know, and I think we need to not gender everything. So sure. people talk about gender expression and what you wear. I think we should talk in terms of a person's aesthetic or fashion sense. And if the, if that changes from day to day, like that could be a mood or, mm -hmm. you know, or personality. And these things shouldn't just be heaped upon as gender and being super serious. And that means that you have to act this way. You need to look this way. And what I've heard from, I have friends and, and colleagues who are clinicians. And what, what they're telling me is that often these kids are really searching for something. And then when they pick, pick an identity, identity um, their dysphoria gets worse because there's much more of a disconnect. And so that seems very different to me than somebody trying to figure out, you know, how to be comfortable in their own skin, you know, in terms of not having to adopt a perspective and a uniform and a way of, of looking and talking and speaking. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, <clears throat> and for me, I, I, and I guess that is where I'm seeing such a difference like I don't, I don't necessarily believe in a true trans, so that's not really what I'm trying to say. But, but I do feel like when I transitioned, it, I mean, I was certainly it was stressful in the beginning going through that the ambiguity stage of that. But there was a point where I just, I just felt like I relaxed. It, it was mm -hmm. about just settling into myself as opposed to I do see these kids; they just get more and more and more emotionally invested in in these ideologies and it does seem to destabilize them more and more right. and more right we're like working away from resilience instead of towards resilience mm -hmm. and yeah and the way we talk about true trans not true trans i think a better way to talk about it is some people are helped by transition and some people are harmed by transition mm -hmm. and let's figure out what that means and who is likely to be helped and who's likely to be harmed um, and of course, I mean, there are plenty of people who are very much helped and their lives are better from transition and that's a great thing. Mm -hmm. And then there are people who are harmed by transition and that's not great, you know? So, you know, I think that there's, there's kind of a responsibility there in, in, in continuing to engage with this topic. Yeah. And what you were saying about it, it's so unusual for a cl any clinical discipline to not be the least bit interested in its outcomes. I, I find that puzzling as, as well. Like, you know, why wouldn't we be interested in, in knowing, you know, the experiences like thinking about the D-trans study in particular, like why wouldn't be, we be interested in those for whom this wasn't the best decision and how could we have done that better for them? Right. Um, and that was, that was my tip off that things have gone gotten too rigid and ideological because reasonable people would want to know all of the outcomes and would not need to disregard people's experiences like just because one person had one experience with gender dysphoria and transition doesn't mean that that's true of everybody else like other people can have other experiences and so this real um animosity and real reluctance to even talk about it, think about it respectfully. Um, I think that's, that's, a, that's a clue that something's not going well in this, in this discussion. It, it is very puzzling. I mean, it, it, while I was in the midst of my own confusion as a clinician and trying to piece this together, I mean, meanwhile, in the background, in my, in my own life, some of my friends who transitioned many, many years ago, like 20 years ago, um, are now starting to open up about what that meant for them. And um, so one of them who I've had on the show, he's very open about it. So, uh, you know, I feel at liberty to, to, to talk about him um, is that he, he now feels that his, his gender dysphoria or what he interpreted as gender dysphoria has more to do with his childhood sexual trauma and his sexual mm. orientation. And, but it took him many, many years to want uh, to unpack all to of that. Yeah. yeah. So, so now he, he regrets his transition and, and mm. I mean, the, and he even, he went through the system when it was a lot more careful, you know, a lot more assessment and psychotherapy in the front end. Um, so it still didn't necessarily, it still didn't prevent him from transitioning, but he said it was still so important to go through an assessment process. And he saw a psychiatrist for two years before transitioning. He said that was still so crucial and helpful because it gave him tools um, that he's now using, uh, you know, to process the fact that he's made this mistake and he regrets it. Um, 
or even just even before he got to that point, just tools for navigating how how strange the transition itself can be and some of the the unexpected things that that we encounter, you know, people people's reactions or or whatever that is. So he, he felt that that was so helpful, even though he may have not understood all the questions or advice from the psychiatrist at the time, but it was stored somewhere in the back of his brain. So when those things did happen, it's like, oh, well, that's why the psychiatrist mentioned that. And it gave him a way of thinking through those situations in a, in a more healthy way. Mm. Um, but, you know, when I, so on this clinical listserv, when I first learned of rapid onset gender dysphoria, somebody po- responded to that conversation by posting a statement by WPATH and CPATH, which I'm sure you've, you've read, that, that they are saying that they don't endorse this concept of rapid onset gender dysphoria, um, which, which in itself is puzzling to me. Like, and I think that actually, um, I lost respect for both organizations when I read those statements, because again, like these are these are organizations representing clinicians in this field. Why are they not interested in the possibility, you know, that that there is a, a social contagion and and more more regret than than we're aware of? Right. I found that really remarkable. That I think it was within a couple of weeks of the publication that they came out with statements. And granted, my research is early stage of, of discovery. It's a descriptive research. And the conclusions were that more research needs to be done. And here are some hypotheses. And the usual next steps are, well, let's support research to further um, explore and identify the issues in this topic. But instead to immediately say, there's not enough research let's you know shut this down we're we're opposed to it you know i think that's really an unusual response and i understand so yes there's there's concerns that people will use it inappropriately and i've said you know throughout the paper that the findings don't imply that this is the case for everybody it shouldn't be used to um, to deny that transition is helpful for some people um, And yet people can use it inappropriately. And I think maybe that's where some of the fear came from, Um, even though I don't think there should be a conflict between understanding one type of situation versus another type of situation. So, you know, I am unaware of debates and, you know, acrimony between clinicians who treat type one diabetes versus type two diabetes or, you know, just different pieces of the puzzle, um, you know, so that was that was really surprising that these big organizations like WPATH, CPATH, and then there's one more recently that had some psychological um, organizations saying we don't like this term. And it, it feels um, it feels very unscientific to me. And especially since since publication, the evidence to support it has been increasing. So you know, I published my paper and then shortly after several clinicians published editorials saying, yes, this is what I'm seeing in my practice. And then detransitioners came out and said like peak resilience project um, and detransitioners said, yes, what is described in the research is consistent with my own experience. So that's increasing levels of evidence um, to support that something is going on. It's not just me, it's not just parents, but it's also clinicians and individuals who had gender dysphoria and themselves firsthand information. So, um, so at that stage, I think the proper response is let's let's investigate further. Let, so, it, it, it makes me kind of wonder how like do these people not have any contact with young people? Like it's because it, 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 like I've got I mean I have four teenagers at home and and I'm so I've, I've got them I've got their friends. Um, so I see something happening, right, in, in the school system and in their peer groups, that, that there's something strange happening that, that has nothing to do with the kind of gender dysphoria that I experienced. It, right. it just and seems I, really clear to me. Right, right. And I think if you're in, a, in the perspective of it's important to understand what's going on, then you're going to say, okay, I recognize this. But there are some people saying, oh, the fact that people are coming out and there are increased numbers and you know, that's only because it, you know, the world is more accepting. And 
like, yes, the world is more accepting and that's awesome. Like that's the right direction we should be going. Mm -hmm. But when you see these astronomical increases in teenagers seeking care and you see these reversals of the sex ratio from predominantly male to predominantly female, you know, you need to not just say, let's just go with the first explanation for what it could be. You know, that's what I'm finding with people who are saying, oh, it's just because of reduced stigma. It's like, well, you know, we're seeing like 100,000, 4,000% increases. I think we need to dig a little bit deeper, but I think there is a perspective of there's only one cause, there's only one treatment, um, and that's and that's the end of the story. And, and I'm, you know, and they truly believe that they're doing the right thing. Like they believe that that's what helps people. Like I think there are two, there are two camps, probably more than two camps. And one camp is this, you know, the, the gender identity affirmative, and they reject the desistance literature and kind of push back about um, the possibility of underlying conditions because they feel that the best way to help people is access to transition as quickly as possible. But then there's sort of this more developmental camp that's more about there are different ways that people may become gender dysphoric and there are different causes which deserve different treatments. Um, and so that's more about making the right diagnosis and providing the right treatment, even sometimes that treatment isn't transition. And I think that's where we have these warring factions, you know, um, mm -hmm. pushing against each other. Um, and I think that, you know, the people involved really do believe that they are doing what's helping people. Like, I think there is some, some unity in the desire to, to help people. So I agree with you because I, I, I certainly know people on both camps um, and there's there's very good people on both camps, very caring and smart people on both camps. But, um, you know, and I, I think those who are in the, the affirmative care or pushing into the informed consent model, I think they really believe they're responding to the needs of the community because there are certain activists that are really kind of pushing for that and and, and claiming that this is dehumanizing and humiliating to be assessed and asked questions. I mean, and that, I kind of wonder where is that even coming from? Because I went through an assessment process over many months prior to transitioning and I didn't find that dehumanizing or, uh, you know, I actually found that helpful um, to have conversations and, and it helped me to just think everything through and, and articulate things better. And so I, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I guess I can't, doubt that some people had negative experiences but maybe that had more to do with that individual clinician and and their approach maybe not not the fact that there is an assessment process so i'm I've, i'm a little bit puzzled as to, to why some trans people had that experience that any conversation or any assessment or any psychotherapy is somehow harmful and and bad and to be avoided right because i i think the goal is to understand yourself better and to understand why you might be feeling a certain way. And I, I think that that's valuable information for, for people. So I'm as puzzled as you are and um, about how there's been sort of this demonization of evaluation, you know, just even the words gatekeeping instead of, you know, appropriate evaluation. <laughs> it's, you know, it's, it's really, um, it's surprising. Because it is a huge departure from how things are normally done in medicine, where there is some some process by which a diagnosis is made, and and then and a determination of what the right treatment is, and and this this new system seems to want to just bypass the condition altogether. That almost like let's just put hormones in a vending machine, <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. and you you know you sign a waiver and and off you go. Yeah. So it, it it's a very different way of of practicing. And I can't think of any parallel in any other type of, of medicine where that's the case. Yeah, I, I, I don't know of any parallels that are like that. But I do know of situations in medicine where an interve intervention became very popular and very common, and then negative outcomes were discovered. And then the medical world had to shift their guidelines. So that might be what's going on in terms of recognizing detransitioners who had a variety of, of um, causes and um, experiences around their, their transitions. Um, but we've seen sort of in the opioid epidemic in the beginning, 
you know, opioids work great for post-surgical pain. And the prevailing belief was that, oh, people aren't going to be become addicted to it or dependent upon it um, if, you, if you prescribe it this way. And then later on, we found that that's not the case. And so the world has sort of, the medical world has had to shift. And the same with um, antibiotics. So, you know, a lot of people come in and they want antibiotics, even if it's not a bacterial infection. And right. so the overuse of antibiotics really led to, um, to resistant infections. So then there were measures taken to, to turn it around. So, um, so yeah, this, this might be sort of the broader area of the broader sort of perspective of what could be happening that sh people are, oh, there are no side effects. There are no downsides. Nobody ever has complications. It's always the right choice. And then we all move to make it more and more accessible with less and less evaluation until we get to a tipping point where people recognize complications and then mm -hmm. sort of, you know, bring the pendulum back just a little bit to, you know, again, right patient, right treatment. Yeah, as that, a, you know, as a goal. To, I guess the difference being in those these two situations, like the one that you described, I don't imagine the clinicians would have the same kind of emotional investment in an outcome. Like they, they probably are more willing to see the evidence that the pendulum is swinging, right? So, and, and they're seeing that, okay, there were, were unex some like, unexpected harms maybe in, in this practice right. and more willingness to, to adjust their practice. I don't see that same degree of willingness. Yeah, yeah, right? I agree. And so like one of the findings from my most recent study on detransitioners was that only 24% came, went back to the, the clinician that facilitated their transition. So because of that, it's likely that the providers of transition services aren't seeing, you know, or only seeing a small portion of the people who are dissatisfied or have regret or detransition. And, um, you know, so that and reinforce their belief that this only has positive outcomes. But it's really interesting in a, I have another data set, another collection of data from desisters and detransitioners. And I asked people what that if they informed their clinicians that they detransitioned, or if they didn't, what were the reasons that they did or did not? And so some people, one, are very embarrassed and feel a lot of shame um, and stigma about going back and saying, you know, that they detransitioned. Some people really feel that the clinicians don't want to hear it, that the clinician is so um, gung-ho about, about the procedure, the intervention, that they wouldn't want to hear it and that it wouldn't change anything. And other people just want to get on with their lives. Other people, you know, don't want to pay money for an appointment just to say that they were dissatisfied. So right. there's, there's, there are a lot of reasons why detransitioners wouldn't, detransitioners with regret would not go back um, to see their doctors. So, um, so, you know, I really support detransitioners who are organizing to have their voices heard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there were a couple of things that, um, you know, uh, from the DTrans study, um, that was one thing that that definitely stood out for me was just the the how few people go back and tell their clinician because um, there's there's always when, when the topic of detransition comes up in this community, there's always one of the major assumptions is a it hardly ever happens, and b when it does happen, it's just because people were were it was because of transphobia and people felt pressured to detransition, and that that wasn't your finding either, was it that that's that's correct. So I did find there. So what my study did that a lot of other studies did not do is that I reached out to communities that might have different views about transition detransition. So, um, you know, for to I reached out to groups like WPATH and um, the APA, where which might be more pro transition and also detransition forums, which where people might be less positive about the universal benefits of, of transition. And most studies only go for one or the other. Like so the the US trans study is really only of trans identified individuals. And then there's a question about, you know, detransition. So so because I got this range of of communities, I had a range of experiences. And so there were people that did have that experience of they felt better with transition, but because of discrimination, 
um, threats about losing custody, um, not passing, um, difficulty, you know, maintaining a job. Like these are these are heartbreaking. And so we did see that in I would say about 29% of the narratives had that. But there were other experiences that we don't talk about, which we should talk about, which is the 58% who had the experience that of coming to the belief that their gender dysphoria was caused by a mental health condition or trauma. Um, and more than half of the individuals felt that transitioning delayed their ability to deal with these underlying disorders. And then there were almost a quarter of individuals who felt that they felt gender dysphoric and, and transitioned due to difficulty accepting themselves as lesbian, gay, or bisexual. And their act of detransitioning was related to finally coming to accept themselves. And I think these are important narratives that we need to, to understand, not just us, but I think the people who are providing transition care need to understand that gender dysphoria is a little more complicated and it would be beneficial to explore with these patients about the possibility of other situations. So. You know, yeah, when I when I hear, um, you know, about studies or, or data or theories about trans, I mean, I can't help but but kind of try to fit that within my just my experience, right? And yeah. not, not just my own experience um, internally of gender dysphoria, but also just my community experience. And what you're saying does match what I've seen over the last 20 years in the community that that they're... Um, there were people that, that I would hear about that detransitioned, and and the pattern has always been when somebody um, detransitions, they just disappear from the community, and we completely lose touch with them. They move away, mm -hmm. like they they often go to quite extremes to get away. So mm -hmm. they'll move like to the far side of the country, sort of move away, and 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 nobody ever hears from them again. Um, and the community response to that is always quite negative and quite dismissive, either a either a um, oh, I feel so horrible that that happened. It must, it, it must've just been it, like interpreting this as transition was their true self and, and they've abandoned their true self and how sad that is, or, um, or just assuming, oh, maybe it was transphobia or there was some reason, some horrible reason for why they couldn't stick with the transition. And, and it was never, it was never very kind. It, it was either always quite, um, dis, you know, dismissive and and kind of abusive, or or just oh, that's so sad, and and I feel sorry for them. It, it was never um, well. Maybe transition just wasn't right for them. Or, you know, maybe they made a mistake. It isn't that tragic. And mm. um, so when you're used to in in the community hearing um, the reaction to detrans. And if anyone in their own mind is having doubts about their own transition, I can only imagine how how difficult it would be to hear the trans community's comments about those that detransition. So it, it makes sense to me if if that's the community environment and the community attitude that if someone wanted to transition, they would just disappear and move away and not talk to anyone ever again. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I that it certainly sounds sounds feasible and. Um... There was a study that was done by an individual who is a detransitioner, de and this was about needs of, about identifying the needs of individuals who detransition. And she found that the participants in her study talked about being ostracized from the LGBT communities. And, um, you know, I think that's really rough. That's really, you know, it's unfortunate. Yeah. I mean, I mean, the friend that I that I have, the close friend I have, who's going through detransition now, that was certainly um, his case. I mean, not only did he leave the community, but he became a truck driver so that he could just be on the road constantly and and not have contact with the community anymore. So that that, mm. that seems like a pretty well established pattern that when mm. one of, when people want to detransition, they they disconnect from from the entire community, not always just the trans community, but the whole LGBT community. They they disconnect from and and they don't. I agree that they don't go back to their clinicians and have a conversation with them. Yeah, and so I'm glad that they're finding each other now that there are now these detransition communities where there were none. When I first started looking into this, the literature, I think 
as recently as 2014, it was hard for a detransitioner to find another detransitioner. And in the past six or seven years, there are, you know, there are online communities, there are advocacy groups, there are nonprofits forming, and there are organization, there's an organization for therapists who are um, working with desisters and detransitioners. So I think that's great that they can actually reach out to each other and, and find some sense of community. You know, if they want yeah. that, not everybody wants that kind of a community, but, um, but I do think it is helpful for a lot. I can imagine it's a really hard thing to study because how do you reach these people? Like how how would anyone survey my my buddy Ken who's on the road as a truck driver all the time? I mean, you're certainly not going to reach him by uh, surveying the trans community because he's mm -hmm. he's long gone, right? So it must be really hard. I mean, if it weren't for the fact that detransitioners are starting to organize and and that there are these advocacy groups, I imagine it would be really hard to to do a study and and reach these people who have just scattered all across exactly. North America or across the world and are just getting on with their lives. Right, I agree. And so the first detransition study, the most, the one that was just um, published, I collaborated with two individuals who detransitioned. And that was enormously helpful in a lot of ways. One was in creating a survey that had questions that were relevant to a lot of different experiences, but um, in terms of recruitment and reaching out to people that I would not be able to reach out to or find. So at that time, a lot of the communities were very private. And again, that doesn't reach out to like your friend who's not engaged in any community, um, you know, and that's a limitation. Um, but I, yeah, I think, so one of the ideas I had about trying to identify individual, you know, and identify the numbers of people who desist or detransition is to try to destigmatize it by adding non-judgmental questions into regular surveys that collect information about health. So because we know that if you go into the trans communities, you may not find a lot of people who detransition, many of, of whom don't identify as trans. Um, if you go to clinics, we know that people aren't coming back if they detransition. So there are these large nationally representative studies that collect information. And some of them have started to ask about tra transgender identification. And so I think if we try to introduce into these studies a little bit more questions, such as, did you ever identify as transgender? Do you currently identify as transgender? Then we could start to pick up in a non-stigmatized way some numbers of people who um, desist and detransition, because I think that's missing from, from the discussion. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, just like you said, it's, it's hard to find people um, who aren't parts of all of these different communities and their experiences matter as well. So absolutely. Um, I still care about my friend Ken now as much as ever. So, I mean, the fact that whether he's trans or, or, or detransitions is irrelevant to me, you know, he's, yeah. he's a he's good a person. person and I care about him. Yeah. Um, so it is, yeah, so much of this is, is puzzling. I mean, the, so the idea of going back to rapid onset gender dysphoria and it's puzzling to me, I'm still trying to figure out why are people so emotional about this? Like, how does this fit into the bigger picture in a way that is somehow threatening to people? Because it, it doesn't feel threatening to me. Like, it's because it's not about me. It, it doesn't speak to to my experience. And, and so talking about it doesn't threaten my identity in, in any way. So I'm trying to imagine, well, because I haven't heard anyone articulate an argument for, for why that would be considered transphobic or why talking about detransition is considered transphobic. Because what people were saying to me when I was raising these issues was that, you know, it was transphobic and that it's somehow propaganda, that it that it's created for the intention of, of, of what I'm not sure, like, Right. right. So, My intention was to try and find out what's happening. Yeah. That's my ulterior motive is like, is to ask questions about what's going on so I can understand and we can start talking about how to help people. Cause I've talked a little bit about, um, cause I did study queer theory back in the early nineties mm -hmm. when I was young and, and in college at that time, I was in my early twenties and that stuff was brand new. And, um, and so I saw, you know, this queer theory class on, on the 
um, the, you know, the course, the course list and I thought, well, that'd be in an interesting elective to take. And I studied it and um, it was a small group of us in, in a very conversational style um, class and met some awesome people. And it was interesting, interesting material. And it appealed to me. I mean, I hadn't transitioned at that time, but I definitely had gender dysphoria and it did appeal to me. It appealed to the gender dysphoria part of me for sure, because it, it sounded like, like Judith Butler talked a lot about female masculinity. And so it, at that time, I didn't, I didn't have the language to describe what I was experiencing. I didn't have the word gender dysphoria or trans or because none of that was on my radar. I, I grew up in a tiny little community. There wasn't even a uh, gay and lesbian community, let alone a trans community back mm -hmm. then in a tiny little farming town. So I was in the city studying at university. Queer theory was on the agenda and I thought that looked like fun. So a few friends of mine who were in art school went to a neighboring university and took this elective. And it was interesting, but by the end of the class, so over several months, by the end of it, I had already rejected it because yes, it's interesting, but I could, I could just sense that it was it was interacting with my gender dysphoria in a way that I didn't feel was healthy for me. It, it seemed to be intensifying mm. my gender dysphoria mm. because the nature of gender dysphoria for, for, for me and the way I experienced it, it was like a, I, I call it a, a cognitive categorization error. It, it was, I, I really think in my case, it was cognitive. Um, when you think about how kids categorize male and female, I mean, that's not, that, that three-year-old doesn't categorize boys and girls based on chromosomes or, or even body parts necessarily, right? We don't see other kids running naked all the time. So it's more about stereotypes, you know, like mm -hmm. boys have short hair, girls have long hair. And, and we try to figure that out, right? As we, as we go and categorizing these two groups. And I just had enough of the stereotypical boy things that in my naive brain, I just categorized myself as, as, as a boy and, it, that, and that stuck. Mm -hmm. So I really identify, you know, if, if we talk about Blanchard's typology, I really identify strongly with the, the homosexual, transsexual that, uh, type of gender dysphoria that he described. I think that's a very good articulation of my experience that because I, of my intersex condition, because of my sexual orientation, because of the environment in which I grew up, where I, I, I think normally um, when a gay or lesbian child experiences that cross-sex identification, normally through puberty, that resolves itself given opportunities to resolve. And I think in my in environment, I didn't have opportunities for that to resolve. There was no gay and lesbian community. It was very clear to me that being gay or lesbian was not okay in that community. Mm. And so I think that cognitive error that I made just never, never resolved it. So for me, from puberty onward, it just got worse and worse and worse and worse and worse rather than resolving itself. Mm. Um, you know, because my gender dysphoria was about that confusion of, it was like a little glitch in my cognitive, uh, it was like a, a cognitive error. Queer theory is meant to destabilize. That's, that's the whole point of queer theory. It's meant to blur boundaries and confuse our notions about things like gay and straight and, and, or male and right. female. It, it's, it's, that's very intentional. It's, it's, yeah, it's surprising. I read a little bit about it and it's, you know, and it's really anti evidence. Like you mm. can't, you know, it seems very unscientific to me. Yeah. Um, and just really, as I, as I listened, I listened to an audiobook. um, you know, it was just very, very surprising and very surprising how quickly it's become very popular. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, destabilizing everything we know, you know, I don't think that's the way to help society and individuals. Yeah. I mean, the logic behind it in, in the way that I was taught queer theory, the logic behind it, we first looked at um, Foucault and then his writing. Mm. So the, um, his book, the, the History of Sexuality, he describes um, uh, his belief that the idea of a gay person um, was an invention for the purpose of oppressing people who engaged in, in homosexual behavior. So prior to that, that he said that there were just behaviors. There were people that slept with people and that was just a behavior. We didn't have a category for that yet. So he believed that the category or the word homosexual as a category was for the purpose of identifying 
a group of people for the purpose of oppressing them. And so queer theory is built upon that premise that if that is true, and we if we believe that's true, um, then what we want to do is make it really hard to, to really clearly de- um, identify any group of people. It's a very pessimistic and, and quite paranoid way of thinking, right? That if, yeah. they can, if they can see me, they'll attack me. Right, it is, right. It's the fear, of, I think, that drives it. Yeah, and I, so what I've seen is I, there's a group called Foundation Against Intolerance and Racism. And so they're kind of pushing back on these ideas that if we're going to improve relationships with people, we need to be taking a pro-human being stance and having a little bit more of an optimistic, growing relationship kind of approach than assuming assuming the worst. Um, you know, I think it, it, that's interesting. I've just started to to read some of what they're and what they're writing about. Um, yeah. So right. even, for, even for me, understanding what the meaning and the purpose of those theories is about, I understood it as this is a political strategy, right? That, that people think that we'll be somehow free as gay and lesbian people if we can blur the boundaries you know, between what it means to be straight and gay. And, and therefore, people aren't going to be able to clearly identify what is a gay and lesbian person. And so they're not going to oppress us. And but I could, I understood that as this isn't, they're not talking about material reality here. They're not talking about um, the clinical phenomenon of gender dysphoria. This is a political strategy, but it, that's kind of going back to ROGD. I mean, that's not how they're teaching this stuff to children, right? Nobody's going into an elementary school saying, well, there's this political strategy because some gay and lesbian people believe that people are trying to oppress them. And so they're trying to to confuse us about you know gay and straight or or male and female, hoping, right? It's, right? it's taught as fact. It, it's taught as fact. It's taught as here's the gender spectrum. Here's the gingerbread man or genderbred man or whatever. And I I do think that's confusing children. And and they're adopting this not understanding that they're engaging in a in a political project. They're kind of being used, right, by these activists mm-hmm. that are queer theorists. These kids, very vulnerable people, either vulnerable because of their age or vulnerable because of a disability, you know, like like autism or any any emotional vulnerability, um, which could be adults as well. Adults mm-hmm. have vulnerabilities. Um, I think they're being taught this stuff as as fact, and and it's it's appealing to to people for different reasons. I, I saw young people; it's a it's appealing to them because it's a club that they can belong to, a sense of connection and belonging. You know, if if they have ADHD or autism and they're having difficulty connecting to a peer group, right? I think it appeals to them that if they just sort of learn this this language, that, that these rules. Um, you know, all these learn, if I memorize all these neo pronouns and, you know, I could, then I can can belong to this group. group. Yeah. And I think the need to belong is, is a really, uh, it's a big deal, especially in adolescence. But it, it upsets me, um, you know, because I was at one point interested in the, in those theories and my friends and I, like I said, we were in art school at the time. So we, we took those theories and we started making art about it. And our, our strategy in making art was taking these ideas and packaging, packaging, packaging them in a way that looked like popular culture. So we would um, make photos and videos that would kind of have the same look and feel as like advertising that you might see mm. just out in you know magazines and um, or advertising in you know on TV. And, and you know it wasn't intended to be a big propaganda project. It was just kids, you know, having fun with these ideas and making art about it. But I think it was, you know, the beginnings of taking these ideas and and starting to kind of spread them out into popular culture. And then over, you know, 15, 20 years, now it's completely taken over. Mm -hmm. Um, But it concerns me because, you know, like I said, by the end of that class, I could sense that it was it was starting to make my gender dysphoria worse. And so I completely rejected it, but I now feel like I can't have much contact with the LGBT community anymore because those ideas have taken over so much that I I would be forced to engage with those ideas mm. if I had close contact with the LGBT community these days. And, and I, and I know that that those ideas I, again would would 
start to make my gender dysphoria worse. So, um, so it's, I've, I've kind of gone through a self-imposed isolation in a sense. I mean, I'm not isolated since I don't have any community, but I've isolated myself from the LGBT community because I just think those ideas are so completely toxic and I don't know how, it, and it, I would say it seems like the entire gay and lesbian community has adopted those ideas and the system of care now has adopted those ideas. And that really yeah. scares me. Yeah. It's, it's, it scares me too, because, you know, I would not expect it from medical organizations and professional organizations. Um, yeah. So yeah. I know individual people who are LGBT, um, who think similarly that the queer theory and these, um, ideas and their way, the way that it's enforced in the community and broad, you know, in a broader perspective, broader, um, in a broader way are toxic. And I'm hoping that there'll be more growth of an LGBT community that rejects the queer theory beliefs, because people are individuals. And it's, you know, I think we make a mistake when we're assuming that all trans people have the same belief, all LGBT people have the same belief. So, you know, I'm hoping that there's room for, you know, for other groups to, to gather and offer each other support, you know, without these views or with different views. I know for the longest time, I just felt like, okay, am I going crazy? Because everyone else around me, you know, seems to be thinking along the same lines. And I really thought for the longest time, I'm just the only one, right? That that is kind of questioning this and, and finds it strange. So I'm hoping there's lots of, lots of people like me who are in the community or not in the community who, who do have a more heterodox way of thinking, um, who maybe just don't realize that there are others who think the exact same thing, things that they do and, and have the same concerns that they have. And it does seem like it start, people are starting to organize. I mean, we've got the, the LGB alliances around the world now and, right. um, the lesbian and gay uh, liberation front is is developing right and the gender dysphoria alliance is huge yeah. i mean i think you're doing really important work you know gathering together and discussing these topics so i think that's pro that that also can inspire people to come together hopefully <laughs> I hope so. And we are growing really quickly. I mean, we've got um, about 30 members now from from all around the world. You know, people are and new people are, are joining us all the time and people do reach out to us and, and have said, um, you know, watching your podcast has changed, changed my mind about some things. So I'm hoping things will start to shift. I mean, it's sad for me that so much of what I talk about and the work that we're doing with the gender dysphoria Alliance is perceived by others as transphobic. And that's certainly mm. not where we're, where we're coming from. We, we just, right, right. we just want to take the lid off the box and, and say, okay, what's let's, let's hit the pause button and, and just have an open conversation about what this has been like for us. And um, to better understand if it went well for somebody, awesome. Like, why did it go well for you? Right. And, and how do we really clearly identify who, who does well um, having transitioned and who maybe doesn't? And, and can we just talk about that and, and open that up? And uh, because what queer theory does is it, 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 um, it prevents us from just being open and having honest conversations. And that's a change that I've seen over time, because I think when I first transitioned 15 years ago, there was more willingness for, for, for at least the FDMs. I didn't have much contact with trans women, but in the FDM circles I was hanging out with, we were able to still talk about having once been lesbians or, you know, why did I transition? And it, people were tiptoed around those issues, but it was still we were still able to talk about that, but with mm. queer, queer theory, the way it's taken over, we're really not allowed to talk about anything other than this political narrative. And, and that's, that's so isolating. And, and um, I just worry about people that are starting their transition now, if they're not allowed to just be really honest and talk about their feelings and what it means for them or any doubts that they have. I mean, if we compare this to like a, a spiritual community, you know, and queer theory is the religion, we're not allowed to ever say anything that contradicts that. And, and so if anyone's right. experiencing it, so it's like an Orthodox religion, it's a very Orthodox religion where people aren't allowed to ask questions or, or disagree with any parts of it or have doubts about any parts of it. And right. And that feels so limiting and unhealthy. It does. It feels, yeah, 
It does. So, yeah, and I think it hurts people who are trying to make decisions too about whether to transition or not, because um, people deserve a full range of information when they're making their decisions about about whether to transition or not, or for any kind of intervention. And if people are only allowed to talk about certain topics, you know, we're really impairing the informed decision making. Mm -hmm. And it just makes me wonder, like going back to this fear and this resistance to the idea of detransition or or rapid onset gender dysphoria, that that, that em the emotions that it, it seems to immediately trigger rage in people, and and. I have yet to kind of hear from people in that on that side. You can just break this down for me. Like, why are you really thinking and interpreting this as transphobic? And and no one's really been able to do that to really break down right. the logic of it in a way that I've been able to understand where they're coming from. And I'd be willing to have a, a conversation with them about that. Like, what is it about? You know, how they're you know. What is it looking like from their perspective that they're interpreting it that way? But it, it just seems to immediately go to name calling, like you're just a turf, you're just a bigot. This is just propaganda. There, but there's I can't seem to ever access the logic behind why they yeah. think that. Right. And there are a lot of um rushing to make assumptions mm -hmm. about, you know, the intention or the person who's saying it or the participants in the study. Um, yeah, it's really it's it's surprising to me. I mean. It, it's very, this level of hostility is really, um, you know, different than what I've experienced in my lifetime, which I guess is good for my lifetime, but, you know, so. Because <laughs> what, 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 what would have to happen? I mean, if, if let's say we had solid evidence that rapid onset gender dysphoria exists as a phenomenon, that there are people, young people um, and vulnerable people who are being swayed by the queer theory, because that's what I think is is happening. I mean, the way that trans has a really fantastic marketing team. I mean, kudos to them that their their marketing team and their 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 um, lobbying is very effective. Effective, yeah. Um, and but I do think there's some collateral damage being done as a result of that particular type of activism. So let's say we're able to really identify that clearly to the to the degree that clinicians can't deny that anymore. What that would mean for practice is just going back to doing some more assessment. Exactly, right? That's exactly, it. right. So I don't know anybody who is rallying to eliminate transition. You know, this is about um, evaluating and seeing whether or not there's an underlying condition that might be treated with something else or and whether or not transition will is likely to help or harm an individual. So really, it, it does feel like getting back to basics um, of of medicine and psychology and things, you know, as you mentioned, it was like that previously, that the whole evaluation and differential diagnosis and, um, you know, exploring why somebody feels gender dysphoric before rushing forward to medical treatment. So, so yeah, I think that would be the, um, you know, the direction. And, and uh, as I said earlier, I didn't feel harmed by that assessment process in any way. I felt like I, you know, I, I really um, felt I had a good working relationship with my GP who, mm -hmm. who did that assessment. I, you know, it, it um, I felt comfortable with her. I felt like she, was respectful in, and I felt comfortable having those conversations with her. So I, it's it's just so puzzling to me why that is so awful. Like this idea that in order to protect and acknowledge that some people are being harmed by this and for whom transition might not be the best option for them, the only thing that, I mean, I don't have to give anything up because I've already been through that process. So it makes, makes no difference to me personally, but right. for what it would mean for those that are trying to transition, it just means they would go through a similar process that I did of, of developing a relationship with their clinician. So that clinician can get to know them a little bit and, and explore things a little bit. I just don't understand why the, the degree of emotional outcry back, yeah. about yeah. that. Yeah, but it's, I, it's not taking I anything away from from those that you know who are truly just you know dysphoric and have been since childhood and because nobody is saying yeah. let's take all of that away 
Right. Well, I, I think there might be peer, might be fear that say 20, 30 years ago, I think the culture and the medical practice was so tipped in the direction of underdiagnosing and under treating. And I think that maybe they're responding to the fear that that might be the, you know, the end point that it would go back to that as opposed to, you know, appropriate evaluation. Mm -hmm. And we all know, and this happened, I know that this happened 20 years ago, that, that people would in the community um, share information about the assessment process. When the assessment mm -hmm. was just, you know, like a checklist of things that the clinician had to go through, um, people who had been through that would coach people that hadn't been through that. Okay, here's the questions that they're going to ask, and this is how you should answer them in order to just pass the test and, and move mm -hmm. on. Um, so there were problems with the assessment process if, for that reason, that, that right. what, it was kind of predictable. Mm -hmm. So I, I actually prefer the idea, not just rolling back to the old days. And I think that's the fear most people have is we're just going to roll back right. to how it used to be done and, and how but it's sort of a new, improved <laughs> new and improved. Exploration. Yeah, absolutely. So mm -hmm. I would prefer to call it, you know, maybe doing gender exploratory therapy initially just to have yeah. a, a, it's not an assessment. It's not gatekeeping. It's finding finding a clinician that you trust and 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 you feel comfortable talking to just to have an exploratory conversation that might help you actually prepare mentally for a more successful transition not just talk you out of transitioning but for those for whom maybe don't actually have gender dysphoria but were maybe you know wrapped up in the queer theory parts of it and became confused or we're right, dealing or with se sexual trauma or internalized right. homophobia that that they could be well supported Right. To uncover those pieces. Yeah, and people are starting to to talk about that and write about that. So Anastasis Spiliotis um, was a therapist at the Tavistock, and now he's um, studying for his PhD. And he's his expertise is gender dysphoria and um, and eating disorders. And he's written a gender exploratory model. And also he well, I think while at the Tavistock, published a piece called, I think, taking the lid off the box that describes exploration and really, um, you know, in a very, in a very nice way, in a way, you know, and others are writing about this neutral psychotherapy that's exploratory, um, that's not pushing people in one direction or the other. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that's a really smart thing. I do too. I think, uh, yeah, I, I feel that that should be the model of care, um, especially for young people. Right. We forget everything we know about adolescence when it comes to this topic. I mean, they're adolescents. Well, one, you know, the whole of adolescence is a phase. <laughs> so I know everybody hates the word. It's a phase. But all of adolescence is a phase. You know, it's not permanent. And, you know, people are pushing at boundaries, trying to figure out who they are. And sometimes teenagers can be 100 percent confident that they're right when they're 100 percent wrong. You know, teenagers are not right all the time. And so if you have a medical care system that is resting on the belief that the teenager is always going to be correct about what they want now is going to be in their long term, you know, it's going to be to the benefit of their long term. I mean, I think that's pretty shaky ground. You know, we have to recognize that adolescents do explore and do explore identity um, without trapping them in a in in one particular thing so that they can, you know, move on. Yeah. If and that's then, if that's the path for them. Yeah. And and then you add the layer of of say autism spectrum onto that. Right. Or ADHD onto that. Then we have to be um we have to be aware of what the symptoms of those things are as well, right? You know, people with autism don't always pick up on social cues in the same way that, that someone without autism does, or or they just don't care about social cues. So they might be more just not gender non-conforming because right. they're not picking up on the social cues or they're interpreting things in a certain way. So we, we really need to be informed about these layers of things and and how the how identity develops. Right, right. I remember as a teenager, as most teenagers, the only thing that really matters to a teenager is fitting into their uh, social circle, having a, mm -hmm. a peer group. Right, right. And that's why selection of the peer group is so important. I did want to talk to you. I noticed um, in the, the detransition paper, um, 
you, you mentioned there was a little mention of the use of language, the use of, um, of you made a choice to not use the assigned male at birth or assigned female at birth. And we've talked about this a little bit before, you know, this, this idea of the, the use of, of certain terminologies um, and the idea that, so you chose to use, um, I think it was like the natal male, natal female language, as opposed right. to assigned male at birth or assigned female at birth. I was wondering if we could talk about that a little bit and, and just unpack that a little bit, why you made that, that choice. Sure. Yeah. So my, my first career was in, as, as an OBGYN. So I've delivered hundreds of babies. And so with my understanding of providing prenatal care um, and deliveries, I find assigned at birth to be incredibly inaccurate. So um, the sex of a baby can be observed prior to birth by ultrasound, or you can document um, the genetic sex you know, by doing an amniocentesis or chorionic villi sampling. So I feel like the assigned sex at birth is really inaccurate. So I don't like using it for that reason. And so the use of natal sex instead of just sex, uh, to me, that's a compromise, a polite uh, way to acknowledge that just one point in time. We can agree at one point in time, this was the sex. And so pe some people believe that sex change can be changed. Uh, I do not. So if we're just agreeing on one moment in time, the birth, then I think that's, you know, sensitive and reasonable and not inaccurate. Yeah, the, the assigned male at birth and assigned female at birth, that language comes from the DSD community yes, right? the, yes. where because there, 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 there was an assignment sometimes yes yeah um and even that practice is is now happening less and less where where clinicians are um you know when a, when a baby is born and maybe they have ambiguous genitalia it seems to be happening less and less this idea that clinicians would just decide you know willy-nilly no pun right. intended, but you know that, <laughs> that that they would just decide, you know, which which surgery would be easiest to perform, you know, and and then we'll just assign um, a sex to that child. So that's where that language comes from, and I think there are, an, um, I think what trans trans activists are trying to do is is say that gender dysphoria is a, like a type of intersex condition. Um, that I have a, a male brain and a female body. The brain is a sex organ, therefore I'm intersex, um, is, is what a lot of them are trying to, to argue. Right. It makes it more biologically um, oriented. So yeah. I, I guess we would call that maybe transmedicalist these days, that there's the people, that belief that there's a medical reason for why some people are, are trans. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas I've, I've always felt like, like 20 years ago in the, in the lesbian community, um, people, like I said, a lot of the butch lesbians talked about having gender identity disorder, which is what, what we called it back then, that this was something that a, a lot of gay and lesbian people experienced uh, was a some degree of cross-sex identification. And there did seem to be um, a degree to which someone could feel that, but it didn't seem entirely uncommon for gay and lesbian people to experience that. And, and a lot of them, um, identified strongly as gay or lesbian. They didn't identify as, as trans. And so when I transitioned, I retained that information, right? That I wasn't literally changing sex. I don't see myself as, as really any different from a butch lesbian, except that my gender dysphoria got to a point where it was just getting worse and worse and worse as I got older. And I made the decision to try to find relief from that. And, and it was helpful. Um, mm. I do feel like I benefited from it. Um, but it's still really clear to me that I'm not a completely different species of person compared to the butch lesbians who also experience some degree of gender dysphoria. So it's it's not a delusion. Gender dysphoria in itself isn't delusional, right? I'm I'm still mm -hmm. able to acknowledge the reality of biological sex, and I don't know for that me as a as a patient. I don't think it's my job to understand what gender dysphoria is and what causes it. I mean, that's, that's what we need the clinical community to, to help us to understand. But it's clear to me, this is something that was going on in my, in my brain. And 
it seems to be an extension of, for some of us, an extension of being gay or lesbian. And, but for some of us, it just, it causes enough distress that, w- that we're seeking some relief from it, mm. um, which is quite different from how they're conceptualizing trans now. And, and I, I think this, in the scientific literature that I've seen, there's no evidence that there is a, you know, a male brain or a female brain. Um, right. I think, it's, I think it's a desired belief. You know, it just yeah. makes it, you know, it makes it more palatable to some people. I think to believe that as opposed to, um, you know, a desire to live as the opposite sex or to transition. Yeah. Because if you talk to the clinicians that have been practicing for, you know, 30 years, you know, they talk about how that this is different, that people really did acknowledge biological sex Mm -hmm. in this discussion until recently. It, uh, the, the, the experience of gender dysphoria doesn't even make sense to me if we take by the car concept of biological sex off the table, because that was precisely what Why? my dysphoria was about. I wouldn't have right, felt dysphoric, exactly. right, if there was no such thing as biological sex. Right, exactly. Yeah, so it's... Um, it, it is that a, is part of queer theory, is to kind of redefine everything. Yeah. So it is it is puzzling how just how much um, the thinking around all of this has changed um, since I went through it and and because I had removed myself from the whole community I my thinking had hasn't evolved along with the rest of the community so yeah. when I re-entered into it as a clinician you know ten years later I was so surprised because I, I didn't see that gradual incremental change. I went back to it and saw it ha- how much it had changed over the course of 15 years. And, and it, it blew me away that, that the thinking is completely different and, and just, yeah, doesn't, very, just doesn't match so my radical. experience. Yeah, it, it's a radical departure. And I, I feel like I, I, I'm being told by the community and the activists that I am to think of myself as a man like any other man. And that... I don't, I don't understand how that would benefit me in any way or benefit my, my mental health in any way to think that way. And I also just don't see where's the evidence for that. Right. If someone could present me some really solid, solid evidence, it will scan my brain. If I got a male brain, fine, I'll believe that. But there, there's no evidence that that's, that that's the case or that that's the cause of gender dysphoria. So I don't want to, to build my identity around something that is a falsehood. That makes a lot of sense. And I, I don't, and it seems transphobic to me, right? That that if we're supposed to deny our whole experience, you know, that our experience, including, you know, having a childhood as a natal sex with the experience of gender dysphoria to the degree that we feel driven to medicalize our bodies, that is, that is the trans narrative, that that is our experience. And it seems really right. transphobic to me that we want to hide that and just kind of tell ourselves and the rest of the world that we're is that we're exactly like, like right, like like everyone else, right? I think you know. I think the move is to decrease the stigma around being trans, not to change the definition. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Well, thank you yeah. so much for um, agreeing to have this conversation with me. I've I've enjoyed just sitting and having a coffee with you and talking about your work mm-hmm. and um, how I just see it fitting within my own trans experience. And I think what you're saying makes in both of your studies makes total sense to me and, and is consistent with the things that I've seen in the community and the people that I've, I've known. So I really appreciate your work because it's, it's shining a light on some of these um, experiences from people that I really care about, you know, like my friend Ken, who hasn't had a voice in this whole debate um, because his experience doesn't fit the narrative and he's received a lot of abuse for that over the years. So I just really appreciate that these things have always been there under the surface. You see, I think they're happening, happening now at greater numbers and it's starting to organize. But these experiences of um, people that, that kind of got swept up by the queer theory, that, that did exist 20 years ago as well, that people have said, I transitioned because for political reasons, or I transitioned Mm. because of people transition for all different kinds of reasons. And I've heard all kinds of stories. You're just, it's not like you invented any of that. You didn't invent detransition. You didn't invent (laughs) this phenomenon. You're just um, 
giving us a language to, you know, to describe these things and to give people a voice um, who've been harmed by the system. And, and, and I, I just really appreciate your contribution to opening up the conversation. Thank you so much. And I really appreciate your contribution in opening up the conversation and the work you're doing with Gender Dysphoria Alliance and putting yourself out there and having these hard conversations. I think that's you're doing amazing work. It's not easy work. It's not easy work for yeah. you. It's not, not easy work <laughs> for me, but I, I just feel like we're at a point in history where, where we're, there's I feel a sense of urgency to open up the conversation and um, to, to, to try to prevent some of the harms that that are being done. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the Transparency Podcast. If you enjoy our content, please help out our algorithm by hitting like or subscribe. If you'd like to make a donation, follow the link to our PayPal account. On behalf of the Gender Dysphoria Alliance, thanks for your support.